Well, today, OPPD declares a notification of unusual events at the Fort Calhoun nuclear power station. OPPD did not want KMTV Action 3 News to shoot this video, but because the Missouri River is a public waterway, we feel it's our job and our right to show the public what's happening at the Fort Calhoun Nuclear Power Station. Water in many places already up to the buildings, with the flood expected to rise another five feet or more this summer. And we're told no release of radioactive material has happened or is expected. This is 5 o'clock shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network. I'm Robert Knight in New York. We continue today our coverage of developing events at the Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant in Nebraska, just north of the major city of Omaha. During our last report, it was revealed that there had been a level four emergency declared at the plant because of the imminence of flooding from the Missouri River. The Army Corps of Engineers advised that the height of the river would be reaching or soon exceeding 1,004 feet above median sea level. And in that interval, the plant was required to go into emergency operations to defend and protect against flooding, of which there have been problems in the past at that plant with leakage passageways at the junctions of walls and of pipes and other related items. During our last report, yet more news came in that during the day there was a fire, an electrical fire in a basement of that nuclear power plant that uh, caused an evacuation of the plant from approximately 9.30 or 9.40 a.m. local time until after 1 p.m., approximately 1.30 p.m. local time. During that time, part of the plant was rendered inaccessible because of poisonous gases and of uh, gases that were used to extinguish the electrical fire. It gets even worse. We now know that the systems that were incapacitated by that fire at this nuclear power plant called Fort Calhoun in Nebraska. It had been shut down for refueling, but this electrical fire incapacitated parts of the cooling system for the spent fuel pool. Listeners might recall that one of the great hazards at Fukushima is the tremendously overpacked spent fuel pool at unit number four. This is an important story, and we are honored to have with us one of the most prominent experts on these issues, Arnie Gunderson, a former nuclear power plant operator and chief advisor for Fairwinds Associates. Arnie Gunderson, what um, is the latest you know about what is going on and what has happened and been minimized in the reportage generally about the situation at Fort Calhoun? Well, well thank you for having me, and... Uh, uh, your, your summary was was really excellent. The, uh, the you know the sandbags and nuclear power plants really don't belong in the same sentence, and and now we're seeing one that is uh, is literally putting sandbags up uh, to reinforce itself against um, against the flood. Um, I think the, um, the the real issue here is why are we having this flood? Um, there's a lot of snow in the Rockies this year, more so than, than uh, a long time. And all of the dams upstream are full. So all of them are just opening up their water and letting it cascade down to the next dam, which is letting it cascade down to the next dam. Well, the, the plant was designed against a, a flood that it can't get much worse than this or else it's going to breach the walls. But my concern is, um, what if a dam breaks? We've, that would be the equivalent of the Fukushima tsunami. Uh, these dams are, are filled to the brim, and there's more than one. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean that the, the one that's immediately upstream has to, has to break. It's, it's any one of a series has to break, um, which, could, which could inundate this like Fukushima was with, a, uh, you know, with essentially a... Uh, an inland tsunami. Um, the, the dams are not, uh, you know, structurally sound like, uh, um, you know, built to the, the same standards as a nuclear plant. Um, but, uh, but in fact, the nuclear plant is now relying on the integrity of something that's basically a big earthen berm. If one of these, uh, almost like an electrical 
uh, circuit in series, resistors in series, if these dams, which we might liken to resistors, any one of them broke, that would put extra stress on all the ones downstream of it, would it not? That's correct. That's correct. So, you know, you know it will probably ride out the storm if, um, um, if, if the storm doesn't get any worse. Uh, they're, they're within a foot or two of, of what they were designed for, and hopefully um, the, the, it looks like that the flows that are coming out of the dams, um, as, he, as the Corps of Engineers has opened the valves, they, uh, they, they can just barely get by. Um, but if Mother Nature throws us, um, you know, a, a knuckleball here, um, all bets are off. We have seen reports that the water is already treading on the edges and the walls of this nuclear power plant. Uh, there was a uh, television station uh, near the uh, nuclear power site that despite the admonitions of the nuclear power company because the Missouri River is a public waterway, went boating up to the edge of the plant and uh, saw it uh, at the jeopardy of the encroaching water. Uh, 1,004 above, feet above sea level going up and uh, the weather service and the Army Corps of Engineers says that it is expected to do nothing but rise until well into the summer of this year 2011. Generically speaking, Arnie Gunderson, nuclear plant operator and uh, advisor on nuclear issues for Fairwinds Associates, what is wrong with water in a nuclear power plant? What are the hazards in the basement? Well, the, you know, there's safety-related equipment that when, when the nuclear chain reaction stops, <clears throat> and this plant is shut down, um, it was shut down in April for a routine refueling, and then they said, oh, my God, we got this flood coming. We better not start it back up. It, it was scheduled to be running by now. Uh, but even though it's shut down, there still is an enormous amount of heat left over uh, from the, the, the particles that are left behind called radioactive daughter products. And we're seeing that at Fukushima. You know, the plant is still steaming uh, because of all of that residual heat called decay heat. Um, You've got to get rid of that even after you shut down the plant. Um, and so there's pumps like the, like the ones that failed last night um, that are required to run for months, even years, after um, after the plant is shut down to keep the nuclear core cool. And, of course, the, the concern last night was that uh, two pumps um, failed in the fire, and not the nuclear core. It, it remained cooled through a, a different set of pumps, but the pumps that failed last night didn't cool the fuel pool, so the fuel pool began to get hot. Um, they recovered the pumps, and the fuel pool uh, cooled back down again. But again, you know, we all have Fukushima in our mind, and um, Unit 4 and Unit 3's fuel pool are sitting there smoldering and right on the edge of boiling. Uh, and, and normally these things should be at you know, roughly 60 or 70 degrees. So uh, they're not designed to boil in a nuclear fuel pool. In the process of refueling this uh, Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant, does the main assembly the nuclear pile, does it stay inside the reactor or is the whole assembly moved to a spent fuel pool? Where is the fuel? I understand that about one-third of it, one-third of the uh, columns of, uh, of uranium and perhaps other oxides were to have been taken out and replaced. Where is that stuff? Is it in the reactor or is it in the spent fuel pool? And what would you estimate to be the capacity of radioactive materials in the pool. And as a follow-up to that, Arnie Gunderson, uh, does heating uh, attempt the process of zircaloy uh, hydrogenization? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, there was one-third of the nuclear core that's been removed and is in the fuel pool, along with many other nuclear cores. There's, there's 20 years or more worth of nuclear cores in the fuel pool. And that's, that's on the pumps that failed last night. So that, um, that generates an enormous amount of heat. And the closest example that I could tell you is Fukushima 4, um, which you, if you recall the pictures of the steam just pouring out of that fuel pool. 
without water, that fuel pool will boil dry in several days. Now, uh, the NRC's position is, well, you don't need to call that an emergency pump because you have several days and you can always spray water in and things like that. The problem with that argument is that as it's boiling or approaching boiling, it releases an enormous amount of humidity, and that wipes out all of the electrical wiring in the containment. So uh, you you don't want to get anywhere near boiling, and I don't know that the uh, the NRC really understands that issue yet. The, the other issue of what's in the nuclear reactor, there's fresh fuel plus two-thirds of the nuclear core. Now, the pumps that cool the nuclear reactor, the NRC considers safety-related. The pumps that they, that cool the, um, uh, the fuel pool, the NRC says, are not. Um, and, and those um, are in a separate cooling system. They did not, uh, they were not involved in the fire last night. But the flood uh, is encroaching on all of that wire. Um, unlike Fukushima, uh, the, the diesels are high enough so that as the flood comes up, they'll probably be able to retain diesel power unless there's a bigger wave, you know, from a, from a dam collapse. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's the lesson here is that... Um, Mother Nature can throw things at us that, that we did not anticipate. And, uh, you know, let's hope that uh, that a, a flood like the one we're seeing is as bad as it's going to get. This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network. I'm Robert Knight in New York, and that's Arnie Gunderson in Vermont. And, uh, Arnie, one of the beauties of this kind of listener-sponsored broadcasting is that we can look in more depth than the superficial ways in which much nuclear news is being covered, if at all. In the past uh, day and a half or so, uh, most... Um, conventional press reports simply said, well, there was no danger of the release of radiation and uh, did not uh, sufficiently, in our opinion, address the issue of the potential heating up of the spent fuel well, of the loss of uh, monitoring or the loss of cooling systems and such. Because we have this opportunity, I'd like you, as a nuclear expert, to help us walk through the nuclear event reports from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. As of the 7th of June, 2011, there was not a, a report on that day of the electrical fire after the flooding emergency was declared on the 6th of June. However, today we now have some items from the NRC's event reports, which if anybody needs a frightening bedtime story, just read these each and every day. <laughs> and Arnie, I'd like to actually take some time to be very specific with you so you can translate this for our audience, okay? Okay, go ahead. All right, this is uh, the nuclear event report for the 8th of June, 2011, in regard to the uh, Fort uh, Calhoun nuclear power plant. I'm going to read uh, four segments seriatim. Uh, beginning at about 9.30 Central Daylight Time, the licensee noted fire in the west switchgear room. The fire brigade responded and found a room filled with smoke, but no active fire. Halon did discharge in the room. At 0956 Central Daylight Time, off-site assistance was called, and Blair Fire Department responded to the site. Blair Fire Department confirmed no active fire in the switchgear room. All off-site power remained available, as well as the emergency diesel generators.